Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is once again the Cinematologist's podcast here at the Electric Palace at Hastings. And tonight we are screening Kelly Reichardt's second feature, which is called Old Joy, a uh, road movie drama. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joined by my good friend and colleague, my usual partner in crime for the, for the podcast, Neil Fox, who's come all the way from Cornwall. Hello. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's really nice to be back at the Electric Palace. Uh, I do love this venue. We um, seem to be having a theme of long drives recently. I know you've done seven hours today, so I've uh, done appreciate you uh, being well, in the frame of mind to talk about this film. Well, it's nothing compared to like some of the, you know, what the uh, the characters go through in the film. <laughs> so uh, I feel like I'm emotionally prepared. For in fact, you should have recorded your own movie on, on the way down. That would have been re- really keeping in. Probably in the more happened on my uh, on my journey up than happens action wise. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so maybe we'll we'll come uh, to that in uh, in a second. So. Obviously, we, we kind of take it in terms to pick the film, and this was your pick, hence why you're up here. So why did you particularly want to show this movie? When we, when we first started doing this about 18 months ago, we made a list of films, and I approached my, you know, my list of just kind of very instinctively, what films would I like to share with an audience? And this was, this was just a film that instantly came to mind as, yes, I'd like to screen that um, and talk about it. And when we kind of programmed this season and, you know, you sort of said, have you got any, uh, any kind of request? This was, it just sort of floated back to the top of something I really wanted to show. Um, and I'm not really sure why. Uh, I, 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 love the, I love the filmmaker. Um, and this isn't my favourite film of hers. There are other films that I, pre- I prefer more, but there's something about this film that I, I just love. And it's just one of, those, one of those films that kind of sits there in my mind as as a kind of comfort or something that I just, I just, I remember the first time I saw it and I'm just absolutely kind of loving it. And one of those moments where you're, you're kind of introduced to a new filmmaker and you're like, oh, mm. like I'm so pleased. I know, I know that this, this exists and that this person is out there kind of making these kind of films. And this is one of, one of those instances where I haven't seen it yet. I mean, normally we've, we've seen both of the films and I asked you before, you know, should I, should I watch it? And you said, no, no, we'll ju- just, just wait. But I did watch a couple of other, a couple of Kelly Reichardt's other films. So I watched Meek's Cutoff and I watched uh, Night Moves. And I thought Meek's Cutoff was kind of, kind of classical, really, in, yeah. in a way. It reminded me of Terence Malick and it was, had this sort of very minimalist, but yet, you know, it builds tension in a very subtle kind of way. So... You know, you're a big fan of Kelly Reichardt's work, aren't you? It was interesting because we were both we both watched Failsafe recently, didn't we? The Sydney yeah, Lumet film, and you know, kind of getting into conversations about Sydney Lumet is kind of like getting into conversations about Kelly Reichardt. The, the, they 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 do things which are incredibly subtle, but they absolutely serve the story that they're telling. Night moves. I I'm not a massive fan of. I love the first hour. I think it's a beautifully handled drama and then I just think it kind of jumps the shark it goes a bit Hollywood in a way doesn't it it's just it's just a, weird it has yeah. twists that I just don't think it, it kind of it, it kind of buckles under the weight of what it does I think Meek's Calf is is a is a beautiful mm. piece of work but again it's it's it, it's doing so many kind of little things mm. that are in service of, of of the story and she is a really kind of astute and aware and kind of instinctive mm. filmmaker um, it's kind of a subtle the revenant in a way, with all the you know extra <laughs> bump taken out of the DiCaprio and the violence and all, all, all but it's that, kind of, much more. Yeah, it strips everything back. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's kind of it's 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 form in service of the story, but but kind of uh, but but the form is so important. Mm. Like it's not just let's plonk a camera and let the actors do their thing or let the you know there is a real relationship to how she's capturing the story mm. and, and, and 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 the pace and you know and and the kind of the the visual relationships that, that she kind of creates, um, but it's it's it is subtle and it's mm. it, it kind of draws you in and it all of her films you know up until night moves you kind of, you kind of think well, what's what's kind of going on you know mm. is anything going on and the more you watch them the more you realise actually she's 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 incredibly cinematic in, mm. in in that way that is is quite rare now in you know because like like the Revenant is a great example of let's just throw everything possible at the screen and call that cinema and it's mm. like. You know, um, you know. Part of this episode is an interview with Mark Cousins, and he he wrote that great thing in Sight and Sound recently about what is cinema, and it can be mm. two guys going on a fishing trip, you know, um, and just hanging out in the woods and and, and kind of and, and and everything unraveling around around that very s- simple scenario. And and she seems to be a filmmaker as well that's really interested in the relationship to nature, 
but not in that kind of like man's conquest of the West type of thing. Although in Meeks Cutoff, you know, there is a sense of the bravery of the characters sort of going out there where they don't know where they're going and where they're going to end up. But there's also a sort of, there is an implicit critique about the impact that is going to have on the, you know, the indigenous population. But and with Night Moves as well, you've got the, the sort of eco-warrior aspect. I mean, is this, is this film sort of along those lines as well? Kind of, but I think for me, it's more about characters who are kind of on this journey, you know, away from society. And the films kind of debunk the idea that you can, you, you can completely disappear from society. The idea that if you go out into the wilderness or you go out and you kind of, that, that what you, you don't leave things behind, you know, the, the emotional baggage kind of comes with you. And all of her films seem to be about people who think or kind of are trying to move on from something, but have to deal with, 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 with something that's kind of, uh, that's something deeper and darker because that that never goes, you know. Mm. And I think that's all of our films are interesting because they, on the surface, they could be seen as films about, you know, this kind of modern hipster idea of let's go out and, you know, and kind of find a new frontier and get back to kind of rustic. But they're not that. That's not really possible. You know, mm. even if you kind of dis, discard technology, you still have to take your memories with you. You still have to take your the things that you've done and your relationships and how you've changed as a person, that still has to go with you. And all of them seem to be, seem to be people who are kind of realising that that has to be dealt with, mm. that has to be reckoned with at, at some point. Well, it's that, that, that idea that the notion of the self is something that's constructed over time, and but you're only yourself once you acknowledge everything that's happened and how can, you know that will lead into who you're going to be in the, in the future, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, the music's very important in this film, isn't it? It's... it's you know, a, a band that you, you that you like a lot, but it, 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 as you've talked about, it kind of sets a particular kind of mood. It's integral, really. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's again, it's kind of one of those on the surface. Yeah, Yola Tengo did the score, and it's like, oh, Yola Tengo, um, you know, very kind of hip indie band. Um, you know, using that that indie term very mm. very loosely. Yeah. Um, uh, it's you know obviously very problematic, but um, yeah, but it's kind of it, it absolutely serves the serves the tone. And, and, and creates a kind of, you know, an, an extra space in the film between the characters and uh, and, and their environment in a, in a really beautiful way. Um, it's it's just further proof of how cinematic she is. You know that everything in the film is 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 is, in, is interrelated mm. um, and has a relationship to each other. And that is something that, again, on the surface, doesn't look like there's much happening, but it, it, it really is. And mm. um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful score, it really is. And and the minimalist aesthetics again. I haven't seen this, but but looking at the the, the films that I have seen, there very much seems to be a kind of deliberately measured way of putting the films together in terms of there isn't a plot, in a sense. Yeah. But it, it seems a deliberate thing to to mark the film out in that way, almost as a a rejection of of you know the, the contemporary pace of of films as they are today the editing and the cutting and, and all that kind of thing yeah i mean we were just sort of talking beforehand with one of the uh, one of the, the volunteers here about kind of uh, barbara loden's wonder and kind of the influence of, of different types of kind of you know earlier kind of independent uh, or slow cinema and it's it, it is it is a a very specific film about people you know and she is a filmmaker who is absolutely interested in people and not necessarily what people do but who people are mm. and is is so brave. Like, you know, <laughs> I, hate, I hate using that, but but brave in the context of what you're talking about, in terms of not doing anything mm. uh, and being and being comfortable with people saying, "Oh, you're not doing anything," or "It's there's nothing happening," or, you, or "It's it's kind of slow for the sake of slow." You know, she's she's so committed to an aesthetic and committed to a slow unraveling of, of and it's kind a of character. It's a particular kind of building of tension as yeah. well, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's beautifully measured, um, and again, very kind of similar to Cindy Lumet. You don't think anything's really happening until you hit the point where you realize all along every moment has been building to this thing mm. so yeah and, and i think that the i mean again we were talking a little bit before about she's an independent filmmaker in the kind of purest sense in in that there is no end game which is i'm going to end up in in hollywood it's all about this idea of making an aesthetic and being a filmmaker in a in a, in a production structure that is outside of of that w which will perhaps curtail what she the kind of film she wants to make. Yeah, it's it's refreshing because you know, and I think she's almost a kind of precursor to to, to a lot of independent filmmakers now who are very vocal about 
what would I do with $80 million? Mm. Like what, what stories could I possibly tell? You know, it's, these are not the stories that she's telling because she hasn't got $80 million. These are the stories that she, she wants, wants to, to tell. tell. Yeah. And I think that is, that is something that is, you feel when you watch her films is that, and, and she talks about it, that yes, she would like more money. She would like to just be a professional filmmaker rather than, you know, a kind of teaching film half the year and, and, and kind of work. But, but the sacrifices are not worth it because, you know, like she, she knows that with more money comes a committee of people saying you can't have yeah, yeah. you can't have one woman looking for her dog for an hour. <laughs> you know that's not a film, and it's like well, it is a film if you were, if your idea of cinema is broader than um, what, what constitutes the cinema now. So, you know, it's it it, it is encouraging to see that um, there are people out there who are absolutely committed to making films that they want to make in their own way, um, and it's it's no small feat that that, that people like. Yola Tengo, you know, Bonnie Prince, Billy, Will Oldham, who's in it, you know, Michelle Williams, who's worked with her in, in a number of films, you know, that these people are drawn to that, you know, okay, they, okay, they don't bring with them necessarily all the comforts and trappings of a big budget, but they bring incredibly rewarding experiences for the viewer and by the sounds of it for the actual people who make the films, you know, these films are hard to make, but you can tell on the screen that, that everyone is, everyone is committed to making this as, as good as it can be and that's just... That's just nice to see that it's not a committee making a film, and it's not let's tick all these boxes. It's let's let's just let's let's go out to the woods and and mm. see what happens. Kind of. Brilliant. Um, well, let's uh, get on with it, shall we? So uh, this is Kelly Reichardt's Old Joy. Because you haven't watched it for a little while. No, I haven't seen it for a few years. Um, uh, I wrote about Kelly Reichardt a couple of years ago when Night Moves came out. I didn't. This was a film I didn't kind of go back to then. Um, I, I just, I love it. I really, right. I really love it. Um, it, yeah. And what do you think? Because you haven't seen well, it. Well, I thought I was really going to struggle actually, yeah. and I see why because it's the. There's a lot of films of kind of that are sort of bromance and men having struggles with coming to the responsibilities of manhood and it sort of set, sets that up at the beginning doesn't it with the relationship with the the wife or the girl yeah. or the wife he's uh, married and there, there was that you know that sort of unsettling notion of oh, can I have the permission to go because he wants to go off and be you know like he was with, with his mate when they were when they were kids and then it, I thought it was going to turn into um the annoying mate who was going to be a kind of comedy double act but I think that the the two scenes, if we're talking about the relationship between the two characters, I think the two scenes, the one around the campfire, where he's about to sort of divulge something, you know, profound and then yeah. kind of changes his mind and the, and the friend is looking at him, well, what are you about to say? And then, of course, the, the, the scene at the end. And I think you called it absolutely correct where suddenly, you know, everything makes sense leading up to that point. Um, in terms of the aesthetics, I like the, the, the kind of documentary feel of the in and out of focus. So it gives you that sense that you were looking from afar, almost looking at something perhaps that you shouldn't be, yeah. maybe. And I, I got the, the kind of impression again as it, as it went on that it was about lack of communication. They had, you know, so much kind of unsaid. It was like the, 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 the meaning of the film is in the things that aren't, aren't really said. And the screen was full of, you know, full of this life, full of this world. Yet these two people who knew each other were friends were kind of completely isolated. And then that feeds into the kind of enigmatic aspect of what actually happened between them, you yeah. know, in, the, in that final scene in the, uh, you know, when they were, were in the water in the hot baths springs, or whatever. In the hot springs, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, and I think it plays around with a lot of those kind of tropes of, of, uh, of the bromance, you know, for want of a better, you know, and, and the campfire scene particularly kind of, presents all these you know kind of hippie you know 
ideas and but then you see the character really you realize that you know will Oldham is essentially playing a character you know that this person has to be someone else at least for his friend or you know he's presenting something yeah. you know, film, film has a lot in common with a lot of films that we've shown you know this idea of who you present to the world, you know, and, yeah. and it slowly becomes clear that the, you know, that Mark has been presenting, maybe presenting something in his, in his, in, in his life, which he's not, is not, you know, a hundred percent true or whatever. And yeah, it's uh, it, it, yeah, it just, it just kind of slowly, mm. you just wait for, you wait for the space and nothing's ever resolved. Nothing's ever explained, but there's space where you start to, you and it looks like it's going to go back to nostalgia and reminiscence. It's like, oh, do you remember when we, we could do these things and we didn't have these responsibilities, but it never it never really goes there. And then you have the, the sort of great scenes of them with the gun, you know, the sort of this all-American movie yeah, yeah. prop that is supposed to signify power. And it's just this little pea shooter yeah. that <laughs> knocks the cans off. It's like they're completely emasculated, you know, yeah. metaphorically. It was really, really... And there was there was one particular shot of the, of, of the woods that, and, and they kind of... Cut, they walked across it, and it, the, almost the green, the, the leaves, and everything were almost luminescent. Yeah, it, and which looked absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And and the dog was great, but it was never used as a prop. You know, <laughs> just a great dog. Just a great dog performance. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the first time I've seen this since I got a dog, and it's weird right. watching a watching it now having having a dog. It, it's very different. We nearly brought Neil's dog tonight, but it would have just stolen the show. So yeah. uh, we didn't. Like like Lucy does a lot of the time in the <laughs> yeah. in the film. Um, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it, it was really rewarding watching it again, um, and loved how the how the score was used, how the score kind of denotes not just changes in tone, but kind of the passing of time, and then how the the, the score kind of leaves the film when they go to the hot springs, mm. and then the score comes back in when they come back, and you realise that this is a moment that no one that that they that they share that it's just theirs, yeah, you know, and then they then they have to kind of go back and then. Yeah, the, the kind of the, the the liberal radio station comes yeah, back on, yeah. and you know, like life Which is, is really resumed. interesting. But maybe yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. pick up on that. But um, yeah, it'd be great to hear if anybody wants to say anything or make a comment. Or oh, there we go, the back. Let's double straight away. Hi, I saw the film all oh, years ago, and really loved it at the time. And when I saw it, it was going to be on here I thought well, I'll have to go again and the only things I could remember really clearly you know how you sort of remember scenes was right at the beginning obviously the bit where he gives him a rub in the the hot springs and just random little bits dog and when I came tonight I thought Ooh, you know maybe I'll just find it boring and it is all that green and it's just like fairy tales and forests and and I think it sucks you I like road movies anyway but it really sucks you in because you feel you're on the road with them and it's just I suppose it's the music as well but it's very very seductive again and I enjoyed it just as much thank you <laughs> yeah I think I think it it really is not afraid to take its time getting to the yeah. getting to the the woods, you know, it's there's there's lots where you're just in the car and the music's, you know, the, the score's playing mm. and there's not a lot really, happening. but you do feel it's so yeah. so well shot in terms of putting you in that car and with those people. But um, it's just something you just don't see that very much anymore. It's like get get onto the next bit of information, get onto the next bit of plot. What's this character? But the whole point is it's withholding, withholding, or everything's slow and deliberate to get to the point where there's the one few little moments in terms of story. That, that gives you an insight into their relationship. And then even when that happens, you don't really know what happened between them, if anything, you know. Yeah, it requires you to do a lot of work. It's mm. old-fashioned in that sense, in terms of an independent film, where, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to take stuff away mm. from it, and, and it, it, it leaves a lot to that. But, yeah, I think that it has a kind of construction to it as a journey that mm. it's not... It, it's rewarding. It has its own pleasures, you know, kind of visual and and mm. kind of you know, do you think it was pleasure. improvised or? i don't really know i mean she they she scripts you know she scripts kind of diligently um you get the sense that i mean you know from watching it there that that's just that's kind of they've spent a lot of time mm. in that environment and that it feels feels like it feels like they've spent it feels like they spent the amount of time there that 
they, the characters have. You know, it's not a sense that they've just dropped into this location and shot mm. the lines. You know, you get the sense that there is, that there's a, they have a presence there, sure. um, and that they've allowed time to pass in a kind of significant way. Um, but I don't know how much of it wasn't, yeah, you it was know, dialogue why it wasn't on the page, yeah. and how, mu how much of it is just watching, watching for the characters to see how they're gonna, how they're gonna behave. Because obviously, like you say, there's no. So much of it is 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 unspoken between these two people, mm. um, and 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 what is unspoken kind of changes throughout the film. You you think it's just a story of two people who've grown apart, you know, this kind of this cool single, mm. you know, kind of old friend, you know, the one the guy who hasn't kind of grown up, and then, but it's not really about that. No. Um, that's a little bit of it, but it's yeah, it's sure. Mm. I think it has to be explicit that um, we're watching. A film about the relationship of two men that's made through the eyes of the director, the woman. And I noticed she also edited it. And I think that's really important that she, the narrative is really strong, but without much dialogue, which is really powerful. And for most of it, probably definitely the first two thirds, I felt very anxious. I feel really anxious. I feel anxious that I'm watching two really incompetent men who have no idea. And I felt anxious for the dog. I felt they didn't speak to the dog, whereas most women talk all the time to the dog or they're checking things out, okay. And especially with uh, Kurt, who's removing himself by the drink and the drugs and that he's not present and yet there's a kind of you're drawn into the they're trying to get present they're trying to create presence and but then neither of them are present and that to me was the main arc of being in a place that is so lush and full of nature and full of the uh, the flow of that water which is a total cleansing energy and yet these guys are just not there so I just wonder what you... But do you think you... they get there at the end? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I think it's left... I think she deliberately leaves it open. Oh, God, yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that what well, I think that's absolutely right because when you get to the, the point in the hot springs, you realise that, yeah, that why they've not been present, but also that, you know, that, that part of them wants, wants something they know that neither of them can have, you know, and they've... They, they, it's such a... It's such a anxious moment in that in that in that place where they are trying to get present but then you know but, but they can't get past everything that they've had to kind of suppress mm. i think just to go back to sort of what you're saying before in terms of uh nothing not a lot is said she's just a, a a great filmmaker you know she just knows how to use editing she knows you know she knows how 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 to use kind of visual symbolism very very subtly throughout mm. um to tell that story and to just to build that kind of that uh, to build that narrative between these two people is uh, great slug moment. I thought symbolically yeah. <laughs> nice, nice slug moment. that was just oh yeah, right at the right moment. Um, would you have a comment? Did, did you want to say something? Um, it reminded me very strongly of um, Vim Vendor's uh, Kings of the Road, which I wonder if that uh, Kelly had seen. It's a much older film, but that was also about two guys who are very standoffish with each other and don't say anything for so much of their trip together. And you think, OK, when's, when are we going to get to the point? And then it's the end of the film, and you still don't know very much about them or where they're heading or where they've been before... And, and this resembled that in many ways. And for me, this film, there was no conclusion. I don't think anything happened in the spring. No, I... I, I and I think they just went on their, their ways as if it hadn't happened. But it, it, I think that's very true. And I think it is un, kind of challenging the conventions of the road, road, movie, road movie where it's a, a journey to a conclusion where the characters discover something about themselves that they learn on the journey, which is, you know, the cliched way of thinking about it. But here... Ex you're exactly. I mean, they could have driven on forever and and still not really come to the point of of having a conclusion about each other or, the, or themselves, perhaps. Um, yeah, I, I I'd like to pick up on what you said, and I'd also like to say the 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 astonishing craft of the filmmaker in that it can be a film that absolutely has no development. I mean, they are lost and they remain lost. Yeah, I don't think anything happens, 
and, uh, and I very much wanted to pick up you. I, I was immensely worried, and I think it's quite deliberate, but she leaves it. Yes, the gun. You think, OK, he's going to shoot him. No, of course not. This film isn't going to go there. Then he puts his hands on his neck, and you think, oh, he's going to murder him. And you see the water, <laughs> and you think of blood, but of course she doesn't go there either. So it, it, it looks at all those tropes of films and just says, well, I don't need this. But I think right. that's, that's what makes her a great filmmaker, yeah. is because she's aware of how the audience will respond to these setups. You know, she knows yeah. the road movie. She knows what happens when men go into the woods. And it really yeah. was worrying. I mean, yeah. I, I think that they, and I think the fact that the the almost the very last image is a um, is a vagrant, not quite, because I think mm. it's Kurt, isn't it? But you know, there's a vagrant, and this is life, and these guys are vagrants too, and they're lost too. And the only other point I wanted to make was you asked, was it improvised? Mm. Um, Probably not, but of course the dog improvises, yeah, 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 and of course, course that's that's deliberate too on her part. It's so clever. I mean, we don't know what the dog's going to do, and of course she edits it. She chooses the best dog bits, but the dog is just such a fantastic actor. I mean, yeah. he just a total free improvisation. I just and it just gives an urgency, doesn't it, to, and, a, and a kind of yeah, a feeling of improvisation throughout the, the film. Yeah. And it's lovely how the the that, that what you were talking about in terms of being lost and being not present as well is given those bookends with the. Rain Radio, you know the politics mm. which is just kind of a, a slight little layer where you know it's not in your face but it's kind of like here are a, a, maybe a generation of people who are, are suffering from these political battles that have been going on you know way way in the in the in the context of the film perhaps. but also how little how little's kind of changed, changed yeah. you know for, for, you know the, for these people who are mm. still unable to live a certain way I mean mm. watching it then the, the kind of the springs moment kind of makes me think is this is this as close as they ever get? You know, is it's not necessarily that there is a past that they are, you know, that they are trying to recall, but the fact that their relationship is built up of these moments where the tension comes from, is this when it goes beyond, mm. you know, but it never does because yeah, yeah, neither yeah. room can. So it's the tension is, is this the time, you know? So, and I think that's, that's kind of why it seems to simmer so nicely because yeah. it's not like they had a fling or they were, you know, it, it's, but it's the sense that that's always been a part of their relationship mm. and they have to kind of go to this place to, to, to not, you know, to, yeah. to you know, to not, not see it through again, but to just kind of but have that moment. What, what you said there was absolutely pertinent because it could have been deliverance or it could have been Brokeback Mountain and it ends up being neither, yeah. you know, in that, in, in, in the space of maybe 15, 20 seconds. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's really great how that, that brings it together, I think, that, that scene. Um, do, you, do you think that by not um, going there with her films, so and she doesn't have these sort of character arcs and doesn't do anything with plot, um, from watching her other films, do you think that's almost a device to have greater social commentary so does she do you think she wants to say something big about society and she does it she mediates through these characters and by not having much drama she's kind of like opening up questions about how we live our lives in contemporary society i think definitely so and but 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 definitely opening up the fact that the audience brings themselves to the film so, you know, you can read it as something did happen if you want. I mean, with the, the wedding ring going down into the water, is that being submerged? Is that being lost? Yeah. Therefore, something kind of happened. You know, that little moment when they part at the end, he puts the arm across and just rubs his shoulder. And it's, it's very intimate, that. So there's a sense you could read it in that way. But you could read it that, well, nothing happened. They're just, they're just friends. And that was all part of this kind of... Mm -hmm real sort of deep-seated, implicit relationship that they've got. Yeah, there's something you know? about this and Wendy and Lucy which feel to me like kind of short stories, kind of Carver-esque kind of short stories, you know, where there is a lot of space and there is purposefully no plot that gets resolved and there is no overt politics. And it is it is about a viewer and the film in the same way that, you know, like Carver is about the reader and the, the short story, mm. I would say. You know, Meek's Cut-Off seems very different in that context but it does feel like it's it works because it's it, it's not doing any of those things and that the politics are a human politics mm. um and everybody can 
you know, in the, it, like a short story, everyone has a kind of a relationship with it, which is kind of different because there's no facts, there's no information, there's no exposition. It's mm. not, we don't know everything. So what we take from it is what we bring to it, mm. um, which is, which is, you know, and it's, it's very bold in the way it kind of sticks to that. Um, and I think that, yeah, she's interested in people and obviously you can't have a politics without people, <laughs> you know, so. But she's not interested in exposition in the sort no. of, in an obvious sense of that way, what is this? What is happening? I need to be explained. That to, yeah. needs to be explained to me. And even at the start, you know, where it kind of sets up the 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 the, the wife character, mm. you know, it doesn't linger on there. No, no, you think they're going to, and it kind of moves on. And yeah. then obviously later on, you you question that whole first scene. Like, well, what does she know about these? Is is it? Yeah. You know, it kind of it, again it re it changes how you view that. Um, and because you've only got a snippet of it, mm. it it's it's it, it's it's unresolved. And and he doesn't go back into the house. I mean, he looks really nonplussed to have to go back. And you get the sense that he might not. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, he does that kind of lift up, sits outside. You never see him go in. So there's mm. everything's up for up grabs. Up for grabs, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Anyone else? Oh, yep. Well, I mean, just a couple of sort of observations i mean i was curious that for most of the film the dog followed and then towards the end the dog was leading and the dog was had carrying wood and was being more kind of in a sense expressive and um you know you wondered if they'd forgotten the dog when they went to the garage because you didn't see them put the dog back in but um i mean i sort of saw it as a kind of uh, sort of study in a sense, particularly the man with the beard, of kind of just sort of depression and mental illness and the story about the man that he nearly cycled into then wove into the woman with, as he put it, the dot on her head and and it sort of rambled and and you kind of you felt that the other man, his eyes, when he's listening to the story, was kind of worried as he was by the campfire as what's coming next and what's coming next and and then when the scene in the spring, I mean, it could easily have been erotic for them, even if it wasn't consummated. It must have been erotic. And then, uh, and then you know, when you, you get the landscape and the sort of you've got the water dripping and then the landscape, you know, you've got these enormous kind of trees and, and, and broken trees and it's sort of the landscape seems to kind of just get bigger and bigger and you don't know what's going to happen. And then the next thing is they're walking and not talking. So... Uh, you can kind of take it uh, however you want as a viewer, really. But um, you no, know, I thought he was because you you mentioned at the beginning when you introduced it that you know, until the big thing that happens at the end. So I'm thinking, well, the big thing is 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 a guy with a beard is going to jump off some bridge and kill himself. But I guess the big thing was at the spring. Mm. Well, I was kind of being facetious because <laughs> um, in the sense that there's no real, you know, there's not a big thing. There there is a moment in her films where. Like things coalesce, but things coalesced a few times in the film, and then they sort of retreated or receded, yeah. retreated really, and then they come forwards again. Yeah. But also, you think, you know, how pregnant is she? Because you know, they <laughs> seem to be like getting further and further away from a mobile signal, and it's a big thing that you know she's had a baby at home and he wasn't around to see it, and you know the neighbour delivered it or something. <laughs> There's definitely a there's definitely a darkness though because I think like towards the end it's he, one of them is not wanting to go back into the domestic you know lifestyle if, for want of a better word and the other one is kind of wandering around at the end and I think you're right there is this sort of state of, of where do these people go where do yeah. they where do they fit anymore and we, yeah. how do you deal with that well it's it's kind of yeah I mean one has chosen domesticity and and children as a way of kind of finding a place within society. And the other one is intensely lonely and talks about all these things he's done. And he's you know, such a I mean, that van, I mean, Christ knows what was in it if they went off in that van. But he also talks about all the cliches of, you know, kind of the places he's gone, all these hot springs and these retreats and, you know, these kind of almost cliched places to find yourself, you know. <laughs> um, and it's so obvious from the way he talks about it that, it's 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 a it's a hollow it's a hollow you know experience. But it's like it's physics evening class. It's the same sort of. You don't believe you don't believe his tear shaped universe. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I felt it was really refreshing not to be manipulated. With most movies, the music manipulates you. I think it's very unmanipulative, and I think it's just basically a poem to 
nature and human nature, really. You can analyze it all you want, but actually it's a, there's anti-heroes in this. Yeah, it's just a purely natural film, and I think everyone could have put themselves in that position and understood that in some way, shape or form. No, I so I think right. that was a beautiful poem, really. Yeah, yeah. No, I, think that's, uh, I think that's right. It is, you know, that, that's a, that thing of the, it, however many people are in this room, there's that many different movies and you, you, you take, you know, yeah. from it, but you add yourself to it in, in a sense. And, and you can read it in, in many different ways according to how you see it. In that, in that and I sense. think that it's, it's, it, it's refreshing when you kind of show a film like this. Has anyone seen it before or? The lady the back a couple of people have seen yeah. it before you know when you realize that you know it, everybody it, it's not it's subjected to call it a good film but everyone feels like they've seen something good and, and then you're you're reminded actually there yeah, that there is there is a real intention behind this work which is which is to to, to create something which everybody can kind of can draw from um mm. and that is it's not just a couple of people everyone seems to have connected with it in their own way in different ways um and kind of seeing things in it and that's 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 quite that's still quite rare you know sure. particularly particularly in american cinema to to have to have films that are that open and thoughtful and poetic you know it's it, is a, it has a poetic nature to it that is and she you know she obviously you know the vendors thing you know i think there is a relationship with vendors from when she was kind of younger you know kind of starting out working on stuff and todd haynes as well and there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of uh, lyrical um, influence in the yeah. film. Yeah. And Todd Haynes produced the film, yeah. put yeah. the money. I was also thinking of David Lynch because you've got the Robin. It's not it's not very kind of bright and red like it is in Blue Velvet. But she begins. I mean, it's quite a bold move to begin with the Robin, and then later there's this extraordinary bird in the woods. Mm -hmm. And the campfire scene is jump cut as well. And then you've got the long tracking shot. So mm -hmm. I was just thinking, oh, well, that's called art as well. You know, if they, it would be saying that's genius if it was uh, him. But, you know, it's good. It is, yeah. It's great. And, yeah. and there's actually hardly any music in the film. You hardly, just on the transition. Yeah. You hardly ever yeah. get, get sound of music. Sure. Any final last comment? One, one more? I think if it was about anything, if it was about anything, I think it was about two people who are on the threshold of the next stage of life, and they they don't quite want to step into it. Then they don't feel ready to step into it. Because even though the blonde guy f seemed as if he was more lost than the other one who had made a decision to go ahead and have a child, in fact, he was also on the threshold of his parents getting ill, his parents had had troubles, and he was worried about his dad, and he had to take some responsibility even though he didn't want to. So both of them, in their different ways, were on the threshold of a next stage of life and they were reluctant to step into it. So what was the threshold of man? Was like, just wait for the mic. <laughs> but, but neither of them were going to do anything about the threshold. I think that's... No, I think it was just carrying them along. Yeah, they, they, they were... They were yeah, both passengers. They were total, totally passive, yeah. Did you... I just wondered what threshold the man with the beard was on. Yeah. What was the next phase of his life? Well, he was, he was trying... I think he was trying to resist being responsible for his parents. I mean, his parents were getting older and getting ill. And he was still being a kid, but he really needed to grow up and, and take some care of them. But he had no idea what to do about no, it. No, he didn't uh, know what to do. No, but that's the that's the enigmatic aspect of it, as as the lady was saying at the at the end. I think. Um, yeah, so someone oh, to sorry. Uh, quickly someone mention. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say I was more concerned in a way about um, the guy in the domestic setup and there was something about him that was so constricted and I felt like um, it was so watchable and I was so caught up in the storyline partly because I felt the other man was trying to reach him that that's that he kind of had a in a way he seemed to have more of a set I mean he was obviously very lost but in the in this story he seemed to have more of a purpose he was always trying to trying to reach through to his friend and there's that one moment where the friend maybe relaxes or allows that touch a little bit but it, yeah how that that's as far as that's as far that's as much intimacy as, as is going to be established in that in that friendship 
You know, and, it, and it's amazing, isn't it? That like the, the sort of you, know, you see it on screen, like the idea of a man touching another man's shoulders is so kind of like this big deal, you know. And it's uh, it, it, and you know maybe it shouldn't be. Well, of course it shouldn't be. But it's a big deal for them, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course, that's, that's what I mean. It's, it's a big deal. But yeah. again, it's it's feeding into something yeah. in wider society that I think is a big deal. But coming back to the main point as well, most most of us now have been taught to make meaning and we're looking for what's the meaning of it and we start to ask questions, whereas actually it's a film that you can... Yeah you can suspend that desire to make meaning and just accept what you're seeing that with with the feeling of all the tensions that that are definitely there but without making a story about it because yeah. on, on you know we, we sort of talk a lot about you know the kind of the state of things on on the podcast and you know it's 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 amazing i sort of said it about the last detail as well you know there's this kind of idea that goes around that you need 10 hours you know, of, of TV in order to make something that is worthwhile and meaningful. And this is 76 minutes, you know, it's just a bit longer than Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much. And there's so, everybody in here has got something to say about it. And like you say, there is, there is things that you can dig into, but there's also this really lovely story about these two characters who are just fascinating people. And you just, you love spending time with them in this environment. And that is, you know, it's just a reminder of, of what, cinema can be at its most elemental level which is mm. you know human faces human bodies you know in an environment with with sound and image in it, so. um, I, I, we've barely mentioned her but i'm really really worried about the pregnant woman i i, I feel i feel very very <laughs> gutted about her in a way i mean uh there's a sense in which she is on the threshold, definitely. There's a threshold, if ever there was one. And uh, we're not really... The story actually isn't about her. And it's sort of left hanging. And yet, if you start to think about it, well, yeah, actually, these two have got to come to some kind of understanding and agreement because they've got to bring up a kid. And well, so I think what's interesting as well is, that, yeah, just to go back to what the, the lady was saying earlier about it, it's made by a woman, and I think a lot of those, there's a lot of pointed kind of, you know, in, pointed things about the fact that these two men kind of go off and leave this woman, and and she she makes them she makes them face things about themselves, you know, in in the environment, and she doesn't let she doesn't let them off the hook emotionally for for she doing. Phoning on the phone all the time. Yeah. So that's it, so. Cool. Well, um, thank you all very much for such a great conversation. That was absolutely fantastic. This is our last uh, cinematologist of the season here at the Electric Palace. Thank you to Rebecca and thank you to all the volunteers who've allowed us to come here and, and do these discussions. Uh, thanks to you guys for filming. That's James, James and uh, Roisin. Uh, the podcast is called The Cinematologists. If you just Google that, you'll be able to find us so you'll be able to hear all the discussion that's been on uh, tonight's programme. So once again, thank you very much and we hope to see you again in the autumn.